In this video, we're going to solve some problems based on material covered in other videos. I've adapted three problems on electric fields, Gauss's law, and electric potential from this college textbook I have, and we'll go through them one by one. But first, a short introduction to the units we'll encounter. I highly recommend that you go through a similar exercise with every equation and every system of units that you intend to use in order to develop good intuition for the numbers that show up in real life problems. I'll illustrate with Coulomb's force law. The force is measured in newtons, the distance in meters, and the charges in coulombs. That tells us what the units of this collection of constants has to be, but more interestingly, the value of this collection of constants is about 10 to the 10 in these units. That means that two comparable charges, separated by an everyday size distance, and with an everyday size force between them, have very small charge magnitudes when measured in coulombs. That means the coulomb is not a good unit for the types of problems we'll be solving. So, when we encounter problems in textbooks, the charges that normally appear are measured in milli, micro, and even nanocoulombs. Okay, enough about units. Let's go to our first problem. Here we have a thin, flat, square piece of aluminum foil. It carries a charge of 40 nanocoulombs, uniformly distributed, and it measures 20 centimeters on a side. The problem is to find the magnitude of the electric field at these two locations, one of which is close to the foil and the other far away. This sounds like a really hard problem, but we are only after an approximate answer. That means we're going to use some physical intuition to simplify our calculations. First consider the near location. This point is very close to the foil compared to the size of the foil itself. In physics, infinity is often a good approximation to very large, and this is one of those cases. We can use the formula for the electric field of the infinite plane, substituting in the charge over the area for charge density. Now, and only now, we are ready to plug in some numbers. Keep the units visible. We need to convert nanocoulombs to coulombs and centimeters to meters before we can cancel the units. Now organize all the powers of 10 and the other numerical factors separately. We could grab our calculators now, but it's a good idea to quickly try to approximate the answer so we know what to expect. 8.85 is about 10, and 40 over 20 is 2. Dividing by 0.2 twice is like multiplying by 5 twice, which gives 50. The calculator says 56.5, which gives us our final answer. Now let's go far away. From this distance, the plane looks like a point. Here's a diagram closer to scale emphasizing this. We can reasonably use the point source formula to find the electric field in this case. We substitute our numerical values and start doing unit cancellations like before. Organize the powers of 10 and other factors separately and estimate the answer. 20 squared is 400 and 8.85 is about 10. 40 over 40 is 1 and pi is about 3, making 1 over 1200 our estimate. The real answer to an appropriate number of sig figs is 1 over 1110. This almost exactly cancels the 10 to the 3 factor giving 0.9 newtons per coulomb as our final answer. Notice that this is much, much smaller than the nearby field, as expected. Now let's do a Gauss's Law problem. As with many Gauss's Law problems, there are a few different ways to set up the calculation. I'm going to set it up in a way which minimizes the difficulty of the final integration. The problem is to compute the electric flux out of the curved side of this cylinder, given a point charge Q at its center. The reason why this is a Gauss's Law problem is because we're not going to directly compute this flux. Instead, we will compute the flux out of one flat end of the cylinder, and then use Gauss's Law to relate that to the curved side. I invite you to compute the flux out of the flat end directly, but I'm going to change the computation a little to make it easier. Consider this curved surface which caps off the cylinder. Each electric field line piercing the flat end also pierces the cap and vice versa. That's one way to see that the flux through the flat end is equal to the flux through the cap. Okay, let's remove the field lines now because they clutter the drawing. Geometrically, we see that the angle up from the charge to the start of the cap is pi over 4. This means that we can think of the cap as a portion of a sphere of radius r root 2. Make sure you understand this geometry before moving on. Finally, we're ready to compute the flux through the cap by doing an integral. 
we split the cap into infinitesimal pieces with area dA, an outward normal vector. The electric field magnitude is constant on the cap and is given by Coulomb's law, and we could pull it out of the integral if we wanted to. There's no extra cosine from the dot product because the normal and the electric field are pointing in the same direction. The area is most easily computed by spherical coordinates, which is what I will use, but you can also think of it as a surface of revolution if you prefer. The theta and phi integrals are easy to perform, and I'll write the answer up top and erase the computation to make room. From here, it's a simple matter of algebra to get the final answer. I want to emphasize that I made many choices during this computation. You should definitely try to do the problem in a different way and make sure you get the same answer. Our final problem is a word problem about potential difference. Two equal potential surfaces near a large uniformly charged plate have a 100 volt potential difference between them. We need to figure out what the distance between them is. First of all, very large is code for infinitely large, so we can treat this plate as an infinite plane. The electric field points away from the plate and has constant magnitude given by the usual formula. Equal potential surfaces are perpendicular to electric field lines, so they must be horizontal planes parallel to the charged plate. The potential decreases as we move away from the plate. Let's pick two surfaces in our diagram and declare that they are 100 volts apart. This potential difference is equal to the line integral of E dot dl from a point A on one of the surfaces to a point B on the other surface. It doesn't matter which points we pick, and it doesn't matter which path we pick either. We can make our lives easier by choosing the path to be parallel to the electric field. The dot product gives us an extra minus sign, ensuring that the change is positive. But other than that, the integral is simple. We solve for L and then plug in the numerical values of the problem. Remember that a volt is equal to a newton meter per coulomb when canceling units. A calculator isn't even necessary to get the numerical answer on this one. There's just one more thing I want you to think about. Near the start of the problem, I assumed that the two surfaces were on the same side of the plate. What if I assumed instead that they were on opposite sides? Does this make sense? How would the answer change? See if you can figure it out and put your answer in the comments.